Hey, good day, everybody. Welcome to the Deal Scout. On today's show, we're going to have a history lesson with Mr. Nathan Lewis. Nathan, welcome to the show. Hello. Great, great, uh, great to be here with you today. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, real quick, kind of give us an idea about who you are and what are you up to? Okay, well, I've done a number of things, but probably the most relevant is I'm author of four books about economics um, with a historical bent, mostly about monetary economics. I'm kind of a big gold standard guy. Uh, but unlike most people in the field, I actually know what I'm talking about. Um, I come from the supply side side of things, so kind of the Art Laffer, Jack Kemp, Steve Forbes uh, background, let's say. Um, and I've worked in asset management for about 15 years and ran a small fund for a while, so I'm kind of familiar with all that stuff. Currently, um, writing a retail newsletter, uh, the Polaris Letter, which just got started this year. It's on Substack. So if you want to see how some of these big macro historical ideas translate into buys and sells, asset allocation, um, might give you some ideas along those lines. And um, let's get started with that. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. So you said you're you're a big fan of the, the gold standard, mm -hmm. uh, but you kind of you know, out of all the people talking about it, you, you kind of know what you're actually talking about. So kind right. of give us an idea, give us a history lesson on, on money and where we're at today. Good. Um, well, unfortunately, uh, let me just start with saying that uh, one of the reasons I picked up this topic and, and ran with it over the last 20 years is because people's understanding of money and even the gold standard advocates themselves uh, we're just a horrible state of affairs. So no matter their heart's in the right place, but they didn't quote, really have a good grasp of, of the principles and history and so forth. So I ended up writing a, a trilogy of books about economics and history and monetary topics, uh, which you can find at Amazon. Um, and so I think, you know, we can talk about the, it's a good place to start talking about things because it's very relevant to what we are experiencing today. and it's pretty simple. The whole world up until 19, officially, we usually say 1971 is, is, the, is the cutoff point, although it's actually kind of a process that was spread over about five years. Um, until 1971, the monetary principles of the world were pretty simple and they hadn't changed in about 500 years. And that is you keep your currencies stable versus gold. Um, in the old days, that means you actually made coins out of gold. <laughs> That's an easy way to make it stable versus gold, isn't it? And then, of course, throughout the 19th century and the 20th century, you typically had paper bills, bank deposits, and other monetary payment, you know, credit fun uh, functions like this that were linked to gold. So, and this this basic idea is very common today. More than 50% of all the countries in the world stabilize their currencies against something. That's their official policy, typically the dollar or the euro. They don't have an independent monetary policy. They aren't trying to jigger the economy with, you know, in principle with interest rates or QE or whatever central bank guys think up, you know, every six weeks. They have a very simple stable value policy, typically linked to the dollar, let's say. And that was basically not only the principle for the smaller countries, um, but also for the bigger countries, uh, Britain, Germany, France, United States, Japan, Russia, Italy all linked their currencies to gold. And so they basically didn't change in value. So if you have one currency linked to gold at four pounds per ounce of gold and another linked to 20 per ounce of gold, then obviously they also have fixed exchange rates with each other. So in essence, although there are different banknotes and currencies there, all the world was on a single monetary standard. And actually we aren't that far from that today. Um, there's really, you know, there's kind of a dollar block and a euro block, which constitutes more than half of all the countries today. Um, so we're not that far from that today because basically it's real simple. It works. Um, if you have all kinds of currencies moving up and down, you get chaos. Um, and people have kind of always known this. So we went from this worldwide stable currency principle to kind of, you know, floating fiat nonsense beginning around 1971. So let me say that uh, by uh, people had used gold as a monetary commodity, monetary unit, pretty much 
as far back as we can see. Uh, it seems to predate writing. So we can't say when it started because we don't have any written record <laughs> um, of you know some kind of transition from it being on a jewelry or something to more of a monetary uh, object. So we have a real close relation as humans. Uh, it seems that as soon as societies get sophisticated enough that they have to record things in the form of writing, they can't just keep everything in their head. Uh, they also become sophisticated enough to have monetary exchange and they've always gone to gold and silver as their first kind of premier option. They often, it's often combined with other things, you know, cocoa beans or copper coins or wheat or something, some other thing, but um, that's kind of always been the premier thing. And that's the way it was for 5,000 years uh, with many lapses, many errors until the 1970s. And now we're kind of in this era of um, floating fiat stuff. And this has happened many times in the past, and it's always ended badly. And it seems like we're kind of in a period of it ending badly now. Well, ending, I'm not sure if it ends, but if it going badly, um, uh, we've had a, a, a process of, of periods of deterioration in the 70s, you know, the stagflationary era. Again, in the 2000, 2010 period, um, and we seem to kind of entering a, another phase like that, which I think can be more um, dramatic, more disastrous, let's say, than in the past, because for the first time we have this sort of sovereign debt, chronic deficit issue popping up combined with monetary, modern monetary theory rationalizations that say, oh, well, we just print money and get away with it. Um, and that is the environment that we're heading into uh at the moment it seems to me yeah now we're recording this in uh the end of 2021 right so mm -hmm. we we saw a lot of money being being printed and, and handed mm -hmm. out um when when you mention a, a floating fiat and and we've seen this in the past going badly you mentioned you know like we've seen we've seen this happen before mm -hmm. and where it's going you kind of see some dark stuff you know in the in the future potentially destructive you said like what what are signs and symptoms that things are not going great that you could see that i don't see um well i think i think a lot of people have kind of a similar view and i hope to add to that uh with some a little bit more historical insight um over and over again governments have printed money so to speak to pay the bills and this dates way beyond way before paper currencies actually uh, one good example is the Roman Empire. They would uh, basically, before paper, they, were, they basically would debase coinage. They, could, they would get a silver coin in tax payment and they would just re-stamp it. They'd just take a hammer and go, bam, you know, and, and take a 10 uh, denarius coin and re-stamp it as a 20. Mm. And in, in effect, creating 10 denarii, which was their currency, out of, out of nothing, right? They just whacked it with a hammer. Um, and our records show that uh, you know Rome uh, eventually devalued the denari denarius uh, by a factor of about two million. So where it used to take one denarius to buy X amount of wheat, it eventually took two million. <laughs> it was it was probably one silver coin, and they just whacked it with it with the thing that says two million on it. Right? If you if you wow. understand what I'm saying, over a period of about two hundred years. Um, uh, and I, I was joking with a friend about this, and we were we were talking about it, and say you know always oh, hyperinflation. Obviously, it's hyperinflation because you know, if you something's worth one two millionth of what it used to be, that's a problem, right? Uh, but it was over 200 years. So it actually, we figured out that it actually resembles the pace of the decline of the US dollar since 1971. So we haven't really had what we in the US would call a hyperinflation, hyperinflationary episode. But we, you could say that we are on more or less the same track as Rome, <laughs> at least as far as that goes. Um, and the, the history is very clear over thousands of years is that countries that maintain the stable value of their currencies, and in the past, this meant a gold coin with the unchanging amount of gold in it, um, tend to be successful. And those that do not do that tend to wither and fade away and eventually disintegrate or taken over by somebody and, and just disappear. And mm. we seem to be in that process. It's a familiar one to me. <laughs> yeah. All right. So 
in in this example, right? Rome over mm-hmm. two hundred years, there the Daenerys went from you know I could buy one loaf of bread for a Daenerys, and then two hundred years later, it took to buy the same loaf of bread is a million, right? So that's kind of like the example that you give here. Like, right. how could we compare that in today's world? Like, do we are we looking at GDP? Are we looking at like a loaf of bread? You know, milk or you know, how do we how do we stack ourselves up to kind of do an apples to apples comparison of Rome, if possible. Good. Well, that's a good question. Um, well, the, you know, the history of the U.S. dollar, most people don't know this, um, but it's pretty simple. Uh, it's actually written in the card Constitution. It's in Section 1, Article 10. It says gold and silver coins only will be used in the United States. And this was uh, in the, the Coinage Act of 1791, 92. They said how much gold and silver the coins would contain. And so it basically worked out to... Uh, I mean, at first was nineteen dollars and thirty-seven cents, I think, but and then it was changed in eighteen thirty-four to twenty dollars and sixty-seven cents per ounce of gold. So, so basically, um, we're not fixing the we're not fixing the value of gold here. We're fixing the value of the dollar. Say the dollar is worth one twentieth point six seven of an ounce of gold, and so it's a there was a little adjustment in eighteen thirty-four, but that's basically the way it held throughout the entirety of the nineteenth century, and it held that way until. 1933, the Great Depression, the dollar was devalued. So, so for this period, uh, the dollar was unchanging in value versus gold. And that was the basis of the dollar, gold standard. That was the basis of all the other currencies in the world, British pound, German mark. And uh, that was the way the big boys had done it for thousands of years. You can, you know, when you go back to the 15th century, you go back to the 10th century, you go back to the 5th century, the, whoever the major world power is, does it that way. Um, and then there was one devaluation in 1933 because of the Great Depression, and, you know, they were in crisis situation and they thought they'd give it a try. And then the dollar was again pegged to gold at $35 an ounce from 33 till 71. Um, and so I would say the, the easiest thing to say was just compare the, the present day dollar to gold. And if you want to, one way I, I think of, of, of conceptualizing this is just take a $20 gold coin from 1925. It's just a regular product of the U.S. Mint. It, used, you know, it wasn't a collector's item. It was worth 20 bucks. It said 20 bucks and it was worth 20 bucks, same as a $20 bill. You could use it to pay bills for 20 bucks. And just look at the exchange rate, like a foreign exchange rate. Like you're comparing dollars to euros, just compare your new $20 bills with the old $20 coin. What's the exchange rate? Mm. Well, it used to be 20. Um, now, and, and it contained... Remember, it's 20.67, so it contained almost an ounce of gold. It was 0.97 of an ounce of gold. And now we are not quite uh, not quite 100 to 1 to that ratio. We're at 90 to 1, approximately. 1,800 compared to 20. It's a ratio of 90. So our dollars today, by that measure, are only worth 1 90th, 1 90th of what they were worth in, in 1920, and about one fiftieth of what they were worth uh, during the Kennedy administration, mm. and you know when you wonder why the cost of a barrel of oil is you know was three bucks in 1960, and today it's you know whatever it is it's 70, and still oil companies are kind of marginal businesses. They're not really making an adequate return on capital at that at those levels. Uh, that's because your 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 dollar is worth less is worth less than it was before. And that's a pretty good measure because there's only two things you can say. One is gold went way up in value or, or you can say, you know, the dollar went down in value and it has to be some combination of those things more or less. Right. Right. And I, I don't, I don't, uh, you know, the history of gold over thousands of years has been that it doesn't just go up and up in value. That's what made it so wonderful as a money, as a monetary uh, commodity is that it doesn't change in value very much. And I think, you know, I've kind of studied all the details of this, and I think that is basically held to the present day. So I think that's a pretty good, good measure of things. It doesn't really work day to day, like oh, you know, gold went five bu- up five bucks this afternoon, therefore the dollar went down. You know, it doesn't really work day to day, hour to hour. You know, definitively. Um, but if you kind of you know stand back from the chart a little bit and look at it month to month, I think that relationship holds pretty well. On a macro level, right? So if, yeah. you, if you look at gold over time, you're saying that there wasn't any major spikes. It, it's kind of been a level um, a level growth over the centuries. Is, would you say that? Um, well, yeah, the, the argument basically is, is if you did have a, you know, a, a 
dramatic change in the dollar gold ratio, what you're basically looking at is the change in the value of the dollar, not gold. So you think of gold as just the measuring rod, which is what Keynes called it in the 1920s. Um, then a dramatic change in, you know, it costs many, many more dollars to buy an ounce of gold, which was this, in 1980, there was this huge, you know, spike. It's really, you're really looking for the most part at the dollar losing value, not gold. And if you look at today, like, you know, the Turkish lira fell out, fell out of bed in the last couple of days, it's very obvious, right? I mean, obviously the number of Turkish lira but takes to buy an ounce of gold is, has gone up, right? It's like, oh, it's so obvious as a lira. It doesn't have to do with gold. You know, in those cases, it's, you know, it's, 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 you can't make any mistake. But when you're kind of in it, when you are using the dollar, there's nothing else to compare with. It's, you know, it's called the money illusion. There's actually a name for it. This is over a hundred years old. The money illusion, which is the, is the, which is the mistake that your money is of stable value mm. when it's not. They're floating for like fiat currencies. They're not stable. No, no one ever claimed that, but people assume that, right? Yeah. People assume that when gold goes up $200, you know, an ounce, oh, yeah. Yeah. Gold speculation, dollar is not you know dollar hasn't changed. Oh, oh really? <laughs> and and of course, unfortunately, we don't have a definitive way to say oh, you know exactly. You know, this guy's definitely right. That guy's definitely wrong. Um, but I th you definitely want to think of it that way to begin with. Um, we have floating fiat currencies. They have ha you know they've definitely gone down in value over the last fifty years. Um, that's why, you know, houses, your, your mom's house costs 20, you know, your, your grandparents' house costs $25,000 and you can't buy anything for less than, you know, 400,000. That's why. <laughs> um, so, so that's a good way to look at it. Yeah. So with the money illusion, right. Mm -hmm. Who, who profits from the money illusion being spread for who, who benefits from this money illusion and who gets hurt? Yeah. So, you know, how do these things come about, you know, and it's basically a political process. Yes. You know, there's some kind of political winner. There's some kind of political loser. For example, you almost never see arguments for a, a long, a bit major and sustained rise in currency value. You never say, you never see anyone say, oh, the, you know, the euro should be worth two bucks. Right. Assuming that there's no change in the dollar. Right. Uh, because obviously, you know, all European businessmen would have have comp competition issues that you know exports would suffer they would be flooded with cheap imports the the, the burdens of all, all euro denominated debt would become twice as burdensome to pay off everyone's you know the, there would be a recession everyone's a loser um and so there's very typically very little political uh pressure for a rise you know sustained rise in currency value although it does happen it happened in japan in the 1990s um, and so if you look on the other side, there's, there is consistently pressures for a sustained decline in currency value. Um, it lightens the burdens of debtors. It makes wages lower, essentially. If, if the value of the currency that you're getting paid wages in goes down, then the, in, in effect, the, the value of the wages go down. And you know, that makes all employers happy, but it becomes more, their products become more competitive. Um, it begins this inflationary cycle where they start to mark prices up and, and and in the first instance that can kind of feel good to to business right like you know hey i can get higher prices and eventually they have to match it with higher wages because you know you can't there's no free lunch here but in the first in, in, instance that's what tends to happen and and ultimately although this has not been really a factor of the last 50 years um it has been a factor throughout all of human history uh the government likes to pay its bills with some form of money creation, uh, which is inflationary. And a big change that we're experiencing now is that is now becoming of the last, you know, we've all seen it over the last two years or so, becoming much more mainstream. Um, it used to be that, you know, only the Venezuelas did that kind of stuff, but now arguments are kind of building because politically they don't want to take the steps to, reform entitlement programs or do all these things it's so easy much easier politically just to say let's have the fed buy it or you know something of that sort and things are floating in that way yeah so who in, in this in this time frame where you know we have the money illusion going on uh the our dollar is going down in in value mm -hmm. right who who benefits from 
from this chaos, right? How, how, what, what wise investors in a down market or in a hyperinflation, like where, where do investors make a lot of money during these crazy times? Good. Now, let me say that I, I, I think that it's, it's pretty likely that something of this sort will, will happen. But it not so much has happened yet. And if and you take my premise that looking at the gold dollar rate is a pretty good, good measure of, of the state of affairs, we haven't had, we've had some decline in the dollar value. It used to be about 1300 now it's about $1,800 uh, dollars per ounce of gold. But it's not a, it's not a, it has not yet become a huge thing. Um, I, think it, I think it will, but we're not there yet. So let's just see how it goes. Um, and so, I've, you know, I, I, I think it's pretty clear and, and, and it has been expressed pretty well because this is, you know, we have literally thousands of years of history, human history doing this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, debt paid back in dollars, especially today, you know, it's yielding almost nothing is tends to be a very bad uh, investment. Mm. And this is troublesome for a lot of people because they always think of that as, as safe, as risk-free, right? <laughs> Government debt, risk-free, you know, it's even in textbooks, risk-free. Risk no, it's not. <laughs> um, and and I, there's a guy named Martin Armstrong who's kind of talked about this. What you what you often see is you is you is a move away from uh, public assets like government bonds, government uh, commitments of various sort, whether it be you know welfare payments or social security or state pensions, all these you know state employee pension programs. Obviously, if the if the value of the currency declines and the value of all those. Uh, all those obligations to clients also. Um, and, you, and you go into um, various private sector things. Um, it tends to be, uh, you know, gold is interesting as a monetary basis, but is also interesting as a store of value in these kind of cases. Um, gold tends to be the best performing asset um, during these situations. Uh, and, not, and not businesses and not equities uh, and not even not even oil companies and gold mining companies and that sort of thing. Now, gold bullion itself tends to be the best. And so, and so from our, when, I, when I look at our present situation, what do we see? Well, asset values are very high, very, very high. And you know, buy low, sell high. <laughs> it's a good time to sell. <laughs> yeah. If you've got, pri you know, you've got that private equity fund, yes, yeah, liquidate that stuff, right? You get that venture capital stuff, yeah, IPO it, right? <laughs> get it off the books at a high price. Mm. Um, and but then you have to do something with your money or something you have to own something, um, and I would you know I would if you, if you if you agree with this sort of view of where things might go I would you know take gold bullion as a as a major asset it doesn't have to be everything it doesn't even have to be half of everything, but it tends to work um, it is literally bomb proof you can literally drop a bomb on it and it'll live. <laughs> yeah. So money in the bank right now. So like let's just say you liquidate. And you have money in the bank, money in the bank, especially if the money, if the dollar is being devalued and, you know, if inflation is going up and, the, and your dollar is going down, right? Mm -hmm. Like money in the bank is actually losing money, especially because they're paying nothing on, on interest uh, yes. on, on bank. So like money in the bank is actually a, a, a terrible thing right now, right? Uh Yes, I mean, I, I, you, I think your analysis is correct. But what we actually see is that cash, let's just say US dollar cash, um, if you want to be very risk free, probably T bills, although you know, who knows what government might pull something funny on Friday night someday, yeah. or, or money in a bank. Um, it, uh, when the currencies are losing value, uh, bankruptcy is generally not a problem because everyone's debts are getting lighter and easier to pay. And so you don't have the problem so much of you know insolvency and debt failure and that sort of thing so money in the bank is relatively safe it actually although it is losing you know we assume that it's losing value it actually does better than a lot of other things <laughs> mm. now you can see because although interest rates are basically zero now they can go up later mm -hmm. right we might if things get real bad we might have five percent eight percent on cash in 24 months who knows uh, and so you have that, you know, well, if you, if you went to 8% on cash 
when you and all you own is 10 year bonds, then you're going to get ma- you're going to get massacred, right? <laughs> at least at least you make your 5% in cash. Well, and if you're in bonds, you're going to lose, you know, 30% in, in capital it is market value. So it actually does better that way. And and stocks don't really like inflation and they don't really like higher interest rates that much, especially when they're super expensive like today. And what you often see is that stocks kind of drop about 50%. Whether it, whether it be the United States in, 19, in 19, the great 1974 bear market, where earnings per share actually went up, or you look at emerging markets, they, they can get kind of splattered for about 50% as valuations go down. And then you kind of get the, some inflationary uh, advantage to stocks, mm. uh, you know, businesses, equities, that sort of thing. So in the first example, cash, although it is losing value, um, can actually do okay. Yeah. Well, it's, 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 it's performing better. It's still, it still might be losing a little bit, but it's performing better than other things in having that money. Yeah. There was a, uh, an interesting book. I, I, I recently read the psychology of money. Right. Mm-hmm. And, um, and they talk about, you know, having that money's, you know, for when things go bad. So it's the opportunity of when things change, you have options. Um, if you, you know, won the lottery, you and I mm-hmm. just won the lottery. We, we split a lotto ticket dollar mm-hmm. each. And, uh, and we won the lottery, big amount of money, hundred million bucks. Where would you put money today? If you had 50 million bucks, $50 million. Um, well, you know, the, the basic stance I've been, I've been recommending is, uh, just kind of like a portfolio, uh, point of view is to have, if, if you look at gold, not as like a goofy commodity speculation, but as a form of cash, and I think I think it has served that role in the past. Um, I would put most of it in cash because you know if your idea is to buy low and sell high, then you you want to wait in cash until things are cheap again. And but you can't just have dollar cash because, as you say, it might go to zero or you know yeah. nearly zero, asymptotically approach zero. So I think you know I would consider well how much cash do I want to own, and then just split it kind of. Maybe it's 50 50, maybe it's 60 40, one way or the other. Uh, you know, gold bullion and and uh, some kind of dollar cash, right? Whether it be T bills, whether it be money market fund, whatever it is. Um, I, I tend to be a little T bill have you know, focused these days. I don't like a lot of the stuff out there, and that, that'll just be the stuff you set away, uh, to for better opportunity. Um, and if, if you look at stuff that's available today, uh, you know, I, I think the energy sector is pretty interesting, oil companies and so forth. There are some, there are some companies that are kind of these cash producing cash cow companies that don't have a lot of growth. They're kind of pretty boring. But if you look at it as a bond alternative, something like bond, um, but pay is much better. Uh, I think that's pretty attractive. One, one I like is uh, the mobile carriers worldwide. I, I wish there was an ETF that gave you good exposure to mobile carriers. So this is your, you know, AT&T and Verizon in the US, um, Vodafone, you know, Orange in France, this kind of stuff. Uh, they, they tend to be real stable, predictable companies with kind of like a, you know, leading market leading position that's not going to be unseated. And they tend to pay about uh, uh, 5% dividend yield and, and maybe a 10% earnings yield, um, you know, PE of 10, essentially. And their uh, revenues tend to go up and their revenues per user tend to go up more or less with wages. So about two, three, two or 3% a year. So there's a little bit of inflation protection there. Um, if they can maintain that relationship with wages then you kind of keep pace with that. And um, if you look at it as sort of like a treasury inflation protected security, that's not paying a negative yield as tips are today, but is actually paying a 10% yield. <laughs> uh, that's pretty nice. Um, so I think I think those stocks are pretty attractive. Not a lot of downside. If it's, if it's trading at ten times earning, it might go to six, but buy more. <laughs> That's what that cash is for. So uh, you know, no big deal, right? And then if you if and I think I would I would look into you know if there are venture opportunities and so forth that are, are really compelling, you could you could kind of go that way. But everything tends to be real. You know, there's so much VC money chasing third rate ideas these days. <laughs> Uh, that, uh, you know, you have to, it's buyer beware out there. Yeah. Caveat emptor. Absolutely. So you, uh, you have, you have some kids. I have, I have three kids, eight, four, one. Right. right. And I think, I think you've, you've mentioned, you know, homeschooling in the past and in, in you know, teaching your kids, these kind mm-hmm. of things. Um, 
what lessons should I be teaching my eight-year-old and four-year-old and one-year-old, right? What, what lessons should I be teaching them about money and economics as they are young, right? Huh. huh. As they're young. Um, I just kind of, since I'm involved in this all the time, <laughs> you know, I just, I just make it part of the environment. Like, you don't have to sit down and say, well, this is what a money market fund is, you know, <laughs> but just make it stuff that's around the house. Right. It's like, you know, so, so I just, we were playing Nerf guns, right. <laughs> Blasting away, you know, you know what those things are like, yeah. and says, um, to look at this, you know, Nerf, you know, guys makes Nerf like, no, who makes Nerf? Hasbro makes Nerf. Every time you, we go to Walmart, we buy one of these things, Hasbro makes some money. Like, oh, Hasbro, I've never heard of those guys. And so we looked at the, uh, you know, at the stock chart of Hasbro. It's like, this is the cost of Hasbro. You can buy a little teeny pipe piece of the companies. Oh, yeah, yeah, I want that. <laughs> of course, right? So, uh, so you want that? You want to you know, share a Hasbro instead of a Nerf gun? I like, well, think about it. Well, every time the other kid buys a Nerf gun, you can make some money. Hmm, you know, so it just just the idea that there was this company, and then you can look at you just get the financials of Hasbro up on you know keep it at eighth grade at eight year old level, get on, on Yahoo Finance or something. Said, look at this; these guys sold uh, twenty eight billion dollars of Nerf guns last year. Wow, <laughs> you know, um, and start to introduce them to what is really going on in the world. I think. Uh, I think that's pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a lesson that I'd like to you know, learn and you know, being around that kind of environment and the history of money, the history of deals, the, you know, how, how things work on a macro level. I think that's super interesting. Um, so so let, let's just do one other scenario, right? You and I, mm -hmm. you know, we, we, have a, <laughs> we won the lottery and we have a good pool of money mm -hmm. and we, we set aside some stuff for high speculation. Right, we little sliver five ten percent of our our fund for right. highly speculative stuff because we expect the market to take maybe a dip. Right, maybe that's my position. Speculatively, what should we be looking at <laughs> with my money, my side of the money? Um, you know, I'm 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 kind of uh, I'm kind of an old fashioned investor, and and sometimes old fashioned is out of fashion. <laughs> so I'm kind of out of fashion these days, but. It strikes me that we are in a time of really extraordinary speculative fervor. Um, and, you know, we all know the Dogecoin story. We know the Shiba Inu coin story, which is funny. Um, but the fact that these are among the top ten cryptocurrencies by market cap is a little alarming to me. <laughs> like nobody thinks these are anything but a joke. <laughs> Um, so you can kind of debate about the future of Bitcoin or whatever. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I think you, you might want to have some Bitcoin, might want to have some Ethereum, some of the top top coins. Just on a, although you know they might go down a lot too. I don't have too much of a view one way or the other on those. Um, I, the other thing is, I would, if you want to call it speculative, is speculate on the downside. You know. <laughs> uh, one position I have recently, I have a, a, uh, some puts just, you know, basically a short position in the Kathy Woods arc fund, because it's just such a example of speculative enthusiasm. Mm. Hasn't paid very well. Um, <laughs> hasn't worked out very well. Timing hasn't been very good, uh, but, uh, you might want to, uh, you know, speculate on the downside. Yeah. Um, gold, gold is in, in a sense, a sort of speculation, um, because we really don't know the future and there's, there's no, there's no inherent valuation. There, there's no cash flow to it. So we're kind of speculating on the future of the dollar. It's kind of a foreign exchange play in a sense. Um, unfortunately, when things go badly, you have to try something, right? there's no, there's no sure thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, in, in terms of, of, more sort of you know risky growth oriented stuff. I, I I tend to look for bargains and one one that came up recently for me is a company called uh, Ping On Healthcare and Technology, which is basically a teledoc of China. So it does it does um, you know, sort of internet based uh, healthcare um, general practitioner type service, and it has about seventy percent of the market. 
and it gets, just got splattered but for by a huge amount because uh, China imp imposed these new rules that said, um, well, basically they had this artificial intelligence system, which was very successful. Uh, it sounds more complicated. Than it is. You know, it's an expert network system, decision tree kind of system, which had over 99% reliability and correct diagnosis and had over 3000 ailments. So it was a very successful system, but China said, we're not just gonna let you do that without having a human, you know, at the kill switch, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, so anyway, it's just the progress of, of, of healthcare in China, but, but the company got creamed and now it's trading pretty cheaply. So, uh, you know, I, something more along those lines, I, I would say there's a lot of hype for all kinds of stuff these days. And, um, I just don't think a lot of it's going to amount to anything. <laughs> All yeah. this green technology stuff, whatever. <laughs> yeah. So um, we're having coffee together and, you know, like you, you've you written four books and you've given me your books on economics and, you know, the history of money and, you know, the mm -hmm. rise and fall of empires based around money. And, uh, you know, so I already have those books, but I, I ask you for another resource, maybe that I can, you know, start learning about economics as a whole. You know, what's a book that a book or a resource or a newsletter or something other than your own, because I, I, I bought all your stuff other than <laughs> okay. your own, what, what's a good resource that you like to uh, find your knowledge and wisdom from that you would recommend to me? Um, you know, it's not it's not an original idea, but I have to say that Martin Armstrong is got a, certainly one of the most original viewpoints <laughs> that you're ever going to come across. Plus a track record of success that is also more impressive than about anything you about anything you're going to come across. And I don't know if, if anyone who's not familiar with him, um, he's been a big name among like the the super Bigfoot investment guys forever since the '80s. Um, and he used to charge buckets of money that, which is why you would never hear of him because you had to have, pay a hundred thousand dollars in 1987 money uh, to get his stuff. Oh wow. But uh, now he's sort of at the end of his life and he, and he makes a lot of his views more or less available for free. <laughs> this, is cra this is crazy history, but I won't go into it. Um, so go to uh, armstrongeconomics.com. There's some public stuff there. And he ha also has some subscriber services that range from about 150 a year to about 3,000, I think. And a lot of it is based, first is, is, uh, is a sort of cycle theory. So it's... <laughs> It's very close to a financial version of um, astrology. It's not based on astrology. It's not planets, but he's saying, oh, there's you know this cycle and there's that cycle and there's interacting cycles and um, similar to the movements of Mars or whatever. Um, and as bizarre as it seems, it actually works pretty well. And then he's got this sort of uh, artificial, like this, like this magic black box, which uh again pulls up crazy things which are extra astonishingly successful um and so it's a, so when you read martin armstrong he kind of has a macro view but you have to remember that his, most of his views are based on these two things it's based on this like kind of a st astrological style cycle theory plus this black box that just spits out things and he and he he himself often disagrees with like he says no way that's going to happen but I've been wrong so many times. Yeah. I'm just going to say what my black box says. And, and also, also very impressively, he uh, had a hedge fund in the nineties and it, he, he said it was so successful that he, you know, he like got pressure to, well, <laughs> ended up, uh, got pressure to leave the industry because it's embarrassing. Um, but he was actually hedge fund manager of the year in 1997 or 1998 because wow. you know, like one of the most successful guys in the decade. Um, so it's not just some guy, right? <laughs> anyway, very interesting service, armstrongeconomics.com. And his, and his, so just give you a quick rundown. Um, you know, this is not a silly guy, right? There's all these guys, they can say, oh, there's disaster, there's doom, we're all screwed. Yeah. And it's a great story. Yeah. But it's often not true. Um, but here's a guy who has a track record of not being silly. Um, and is now, you know, if I sound kind of gloom and doomy, you know, he's times three. Um, yeah, and this is, you know, the serious market guy that says, you know, this is just going to, we are at that time of the cycle. And I, I, I kind of buy the, the, you know, Strauss and how forth turning thing. 
as well. And he says, yeah, this is just the time of the cycle and these things are lining up and everything's lining up that things are just going to go kerfluey. And you know, if Armstrong's right, then not much else besides cold is going to make it. Uh, who knows, right? Um, but if you want to get to the other side, you got to have some diversification. I, you know, wouldn't put all your money, all your bets on one thing, but but keep it, you know, keep it safe, keep it stable. Probably U.S. centric. He he's he's U.S. centric, and I am too. Because as bad as things are in the United States, they're worse elsewhere. Mm. We're now kind of in this, uh, you know, great reset stuff which we think we have to take seriously. And if, and if that great reset stuff is real, mm. then it's going to be pretty wild. So that's a when resource you, that I would recommend. When you look at economics in the, the doom and gloom, right? So if you study economics, if you study world history, if you study stuff, sometimes it could get a little dark, right? Especially when you're like, oh man, I'm seeing patterns, right? Yeah. How do you keep an optimistic view or how do you keep yourself from going mad? And, and that's when, good. When yeah. You see what you're facing in this world today in the economics. Well, I, I think I was I have two amp, uh, parts of, to answer your question. First of all, is that disasters are pretty common. Um, we haven't had many disasters in the US, but if you look around the world, everybody has had a lot of disasters in the last 200 years. And I'm not, I'm not just talking about, you know, Peru. I'm talking about Japan, talking about Germany, talking about Russia, talking about China, talking about France. <laughs> just like, you know, getting invaded by the German army, 1939. Kind of a bummer if you're living in France, although things didn't work out that badly. Um, so the point is, you know, developed economies, the most successful, the most, I don't know, rigorous in the world have had just bone crunching disasters. And they've also recovered from them. Um, so yeah, even if we just went to, even if nothing particularly happened, we had a, just a boring recession and, and asset valuations went to just their historical averages, which is like 70% lower from here, that would feel like a disaster, but it would actually be like almost irrelevant. Mm. <laughs> but if we, but I think that we are approaching a, a period of disaster for the world and the United States that will be comparable maybe to the civil war period. Um, you know, World War II, it was very dramatic, but no bombs fell on U.S. soil, right? No invading armies came and left. Um, it was pretty harmless, really. Uh, but if you think about the Civil War and just how disruptive that was and where the whole future of the country was in doubt and everyone was dying all around you and, and so forth, um, we may be, I, you know, I take seriously that we could be in a period like that. And the U.S. came out of it and it was very successful. And so... If you to, now to answer your question, where do you find the optimism? Uh, when I, I my my latest book is called the, the Magic Formula, and it kind of summarizes this supply side viewpoint. And I was looking at this, and I said, you know, whatever's going to happen, if all this Martin Armstrong stuff comes true, uh, there's nothing I could do about it, right? The historical wheels are turning, and some guy tweeting is not going to change the course of history. Um, but I, I wrote the book, and I, I, and you could even say all of my books, but to focus on the period that comes after, because if you look at the period that comes after these these times, all the old stuff is gone. You can't you can't rebuild it. You can't keep it. You know, slavery in the South was gone, right? Uh, uh, the world before 1940 was gone, um, and people have people make new arrangements. You know, whatever the you know, the Japanese Empire was gone. And people make new arrangements. And that is when whatever is in people's heads becomes reality. And if that is the communist revolution, it's going to really suck, right? Um, which was kind of like the outcome of World War I for Russia, because in 1917, there was chaos created by World War I, and, and that's kind of how it worked out. Um, but if the ideas in your head are the right ones, and and successful ones, then you could have this period that is in fact better than what we've had during our lifetimes, right? I, just, I was just complaining about floating fiat currencies. Um, and the supply side view, the Steve Forbes view, my view, the theme of the magic formula is in that period of crisis, there's gonna be just madness, 
right? Uh, you know, stuff to f fires to put out everywhere, right? Um, and there's going to be all these people, all this people's opinions and debate and all this stuff. And you want to keep your focus uh, as there was after the Revolutionary War <laughs> also. Um, and that's when you want to focus, at least in terms of economic policy, but, but it maybe in terms of you know, broader issues. Uh, I say two things you want to get right. That is stable money, um, not floating fiat currencies, and low taxes. And we have a model for low taxes, which we've been thinking around with the last 30 years. It's, you know, it's, the, it's the flat tax, you know, the Jack Kemp version. It's the fair tax, that kind of the sales tax thing that came up. And that has evolved over time. You got a Herman Cain's 999 plan. And you're going to have to come up with some, I think a solution along those lines could work very well, uh, which is kind of a new thing. Um, so we're talking about, we tried the 16th, you know, we tried the progressive income tax. We did the 16th amendment, totally sucked. <laughs> Get rid of it. And like countries like Hong Kong, like Singapore have done, um, they don't do that stuff. Um, that would be a time, you know, typically, when do countries go back to a gold standard? Um, it's when the, the, the prior arrangement goes up in flames. Uh, United States or the American colonies had 100 years of government printed paper currencies that weren't worth a damn. From the 17th century up to the Revolutionary War, there's actually hyperinflation during the Revolutionary War. And they said, no, we can't have that anymore. And that began, began uh, you know, almost two centuries of gold standard discipline in the United States during which the dollar, which, which before it was like this junk, uh, became the, the world's premier currency. Um, that changed a hundred years of paper money foolishness in the American colonies. So if you, so we have those two, you know, those two, I, I would say stable money, uh, at least please consider going back to gold uh, because when you leave fallible, politically influenced humans and charge your money, bad things eventually happen. <laughs> um, it's been our lesson for, I wrote a book about it, my third book, Gold, the Final Standard. It, it basically that one theme <laughs> over 5,000 years. Um, and, and low taxes. And, and I, th I think another thing that's going to come up that we're going to do is, oh, it, you know, read the Constitution. If there's, a, there's one other resource I would say. Uh, it's a book called The Making of America by Cleon Scouse, and it came out in the 80s figure out the ideas that went to the constitution because they're really good. Um, and one of the ideas was that the federal government would be limited, limited government. You might remember that one. Mm -hmm. When I think about how little I knew about it myself five years ago before devoting some time to study these things, I realized how little other people would know about it too. And the basic model of the federal government was that it would basically be, it's basically foreign affairs. Right, it's the military, it's foreign policy, it's foreign trade, it's immigration, and it's a little bit of taxes to pay for those things, and that's all. Uh, all the domestic stuff is done at the state level, so you can still have welfare, you can still have food stamps, you can still have health care if you want to, although you might debate that, but just do it at the state level, um, and and I think we might come to a point. Um, and this is, you know, constitutionalists have been talking about this for 60, 70 years now. But I, I think about it, it's like, what's going to happen, right? And at some point, if they can't finance a deficit without printing money, if people will no longer buy these government bonds, mm -hmm. then they're going to have to cut somebody off, <laughs> right? Basically is what it yeah. amounts to. But two things are going to happen. Yeah, they're going to have to cut somebody off. And probably they're going to print the money. <laughs> And then going to have that whole cycle. But eventually, it's going to come back to the same question. You're going to have to cut somebody off. And so basically, I'd say when that day comes, you're going to need a solution. And you're not going to debate it for five years. You're going to need a solution this week. And the solution is going to be just cut off all the domestic policy of the federal government. Just turn off the switch. You know, it's maybe except for Social Security, but probably worthless then. All the, me all, all the Medicare, all the Medicaid, all the 190 means-based, uh, means-tested federal welfare programs, which didn't exist before the Johnson administration, cut it off. And if you did that, you could run the federal government. You know, what is really important, you know, maintaining the borders, you know, maintaining the military, 
uh, pay for that and everything else just cut it off. And which will become then become state policy. It's not, you don't eliminate it necessarily, but it just means that states are responsible. Um, and that, so it could actually happen. Uh, if, if you look at, I, I look at other societies that got themselves in trouble and two good examples were Germany and Japan after World War II. The war is over, but this is, there's a disaster. It's hyperinflation, uh, very high taxes, kind of left over from the war. Also the US occupation, another story, but. Um, and so how do they fix it? And what they did is they got this guy, this guy from uh, Chicago, Joseph Dodge. And he came in, he said, well, you guys got to stabilize. You can't just print the money, right? Like, well, we got to pay for all our stuff. Okay. So they passed a law that said, no more deficit financing. You cannot spend any money until you first receive it in tax revenue. That was the first thing. And that law stood until 1965 in Japan. They could not spend money until it was, you know, it was written out. They could not spend money until after it had hit their bank account. Yeah. Um, and then once they took this, the, the pressure off the central bank to print, you know, print money to finance government, they went back to the gold standard, uh, both German mark and Japanese yen, once again, pegged to gold. Um, and they were gigantically successful. During the 1950s, and 1960s, Japanese economy actually got 16 times larger. <laughs> Uh, is one of the most phenomenal growth periods um, of all time. Um, it's another thing I have in my fourth book. Uh, people say, oh, you know, high growth is better. Yeah, they don't have realize how fast economies can grow, you know. Um, so that's, that's the payoff for getting it right. <laughs> U.S. Yeah. economy could grow four, five, six, 10, 20 times larger. So, Nathan, you've got a ton of knowledge. You've got four books under the belt. Uh, you're building a, you have a newsletter that you mm -hmm. share with your subscribers, kind of giving your views on a macro level of what's going on in the economy. What are you doing, you know, and, and how you approach different things. If, you know, we have someone in the audience who would like to check that out, where could they go to connect with you and do a deal with you and learn with you? Good. Uh, my website, uh, my macro website is a new world economics.com. It's not so much about investing. It's more about economic theory and history and all this stuff. It's got a ton of stuff on it. Um, so hopefully if you have an interest in economics, uh, it's a, that'll be a resource. Um, it's got stuff that's kind of, you know, uh, policy, I'm not, not, not quite policy wonky, but it's for, it's for people who have followed these topics for a long time. And it's also, it's also got stuff and I have a, I have a Forbes column, which I contribute from time to time, which is intended for the first time reader has no, no idea where I, who I am. Uh, you know, a thousand words kind of stuff. So uh, that's been around, um, I started in 2005. So it's been around a while. Uh, then I, uh, and it's got links to the newsletter there. Um, it's got my, got links to my books there. Uh, two of my books are actually available in free PDF format because um, books about economics don't really sell. So I just figured I'd give them away. <laughs> um, and also I have a lot of foreign, you know, some guys, a college student in India, not going to buy your book right <laughs> but you can download it on on from pdf so it's got some it's got some free books there uh, if you if you like to read books uh that's where i'd go and it's got links there to my newsletter which is which is on substack which i have to say uh is does a very good job of handling all the billing and and all the all the background stuff so so it turned out to be a good choice um that's the destination very cool. And you provided those. We'll put those in the show in the show notes. So you're listening into this podcast show, whether, you know, on, on one of our, you know, Google or Stitcher, or iHeart, whatever, wherever you're listening to, you can always click on the show notes and you'll go directly to our guests, reach out to our guests, say thank you for being on the show and find a way to do a deal with them. If what they're saying is interesting and resonates with you. If you're working on a deal, looking for a deal or need some help with a deal, head on over to thedealscout.com, fill out a quick form, maybe get you on the show next, talk about uh, your deal. Till then, talk to you all on the next episode. See you, everybody.